we are uh, handling with the next gen program of the AAA of the International Insolvency Institute. <coughs> we are pleased to have um, our president, Deborah Grassbring, here with us. She will be doing some talking at the end of the session. And right now, we have the president of the, uh, the director of the AAA, uh, Dr. Annika Wolf. Uh, can you give us some uh, insight, please, Annika? Well, hello everyone and um, again, you know, we're very pleased um, to have us to hold this uh, first uh, seminar or webinar um, in these crazy times that we're having. And I'm very pleased um, that the next trends have reached out um, to the executive committee um, to initiate um, these webinars um, with the support um, of the AAA members. So I think it's a great initiative and I want to uh, give a thank you um, to Carlo Ghia, to Domenico Benincasa and Francesca uh, Borigo, who've initiated it, and also Teresa Vertiz and then Ivan Romo, who's driving it forward um, so that we can have the first um, webinar um, today. So it's, as again, it's the first one, it's talking about um, the US, we will have more talking about EMEA um, and also about Asia. Um, if any of you would like to hold another webinar, um, please reach out to us and we're happy to, um, you know, give you uh, the room so we can have an exchange about what's happening around the world in these crazy times. And with this, I'm giving it back to Ivan. You know, enjoy and looking forward to seeing you soon. Thanks. Thank you, Annika. So, uh, a little rules for everybody. Uh, the um, microphones will be muted. So, uh, you have a Q&A a button in, in your um, screen. If you have any question, you can uh, type it out and we will try to answer it, all of them, at the uh, end of the, um, of the panel. So uh, we have been struggling with a new era because some people have been saying that this will be considered a new era. Everything has been changing uh, since the pandemic. All of us, we have to uh, create a new way to see the world, working uh, through internet like we are doing right now, uh, dealing with the, all the problems that the going into the lockdown is generating. So right now we are going to talk about uh, one of the biggest economies in the world and how its impact of this pandemic is struggling inside and outside. So we have four of, great, uh, of our greatest uh, panelists uh, and people that know all the matters in these areas. Uh, I'm not going into the and resumes of each one, they will be, you will be able to see it in the web page. You can look for them, but uh, for now, you can uh, see that we have a, a Judge Stone with us, um, Stephen Carman, uh, Evan Soccer, and Eric Danner, that uh, they will be trying to give us a whole perspective of what's happening in the U.S. and abroad regarding this pandemic. Uh, with this said, I want to uh, go into some a macroeconomic perspective. Uh, what's the nature of the U.S. response to this pandemic? How is affecting this inside and outside? Steve, can you please give us some insight? Sure, uh, Ivan. Um, the U.S. government response has um, been uh, two-sided. There's the fiscal side, uh, the legislation passed by Congress and signed into law by the president. And then there's the monetary side, the steps that the Federal Reserve has taken. The uh, size and scope of the response has been um, truly staggering. Um, in the past, uh, the level of funding that's included in the response uh, would have been unthinkable. Uh, for example, back in the 0809 crisis, Congress uh, was reluctant uh, to go over a trillion dollars in recovery funding uh, for the Obama recovery plan. Uh, they came in at 785 billion and the Obama administration dared not go near the trillion mark. Well, already Congress uh, has appropriated $3 trillion of relief uh, efforts uh, to deal with the COVID-19 situation. 
Similarly, uh, the Federal Reserve has uh, pumped trillions of dollars into the economy. And so um, the Fed is um, trying to keep the financial markets operational and liquid. And uh, the Fed has drawn on its playbook from 2008, 2009 to support particular parts of the financial markets, such as commercial paper. Um, but it has also uh, introduced new programs, uh, for example, to purchase corporate debt, which it had never done before. So the uh, actions, and of course, it's reduced interest rates to near zero levels. On the congressional side, the uh, major piece, piece of legislation was the CARES Act, which was um, passed in late March, signed into law in late March. And that was a bill uh, of $2.3 trillion. The centerpiece of that bill was um, the so-called Paycheck uh, Protection Program, the PPP, which would be administered by the Small Business Administration for loans to small businesses. But uh, the federal response has been strong. The question is whether uh, it will be strong enough to help the U.S. economy emerge from this very deep uh, trough it finds itself in. Okay, great. Let me ask you something else, Steve. Do, do you believe that uh, this crisis is similar to the former crisis or this have a specific situation uh, regarding the lockdown and the attending of the pandemic? Well, this is very different from the 08-09 financial crisis because that was uh, a crisis centered on the financial sector. Here, with the lockdowns shutting down business across the country and indeed across the world, the locus of this crisis is in the real economy. And uh, that's why it will be so important for the federal response to address problems in the real economy. That's what Congress and the Federal Reserve are trying to do. And as I said a moment ago, um, it's not clear that what has been done so far will be adequate. I'll just make one last quick point. What has happened so far, particularly on the congressional side, is more of a relief effort. Um, it is not really what we would call the classic response to a recession, which is stimulus uh, programs. So uh, that remains to be done by Congress, stimulus. Thank you, Steve. Your Honor, um, what's going on uh, without um, the court's perspective? Within the court's perspective, uh, you have been a struggle with a different situation. How do the, the U.S. courts receive this pandemic? Uh, thank you, Ivan, uh, and thank you all for the chance to be part of this program. I, I'm on record in countless venues saying how much I admire and enjoy NextGen and the energy that you bring to everything that we do at Triple I, you make us better. So I say thank you for that, one and all. Um, how was COVID-19 received by the courts? Uh, well, you know, you said everything has changed, and in a way that's true, and in another way nothing has changed. Um, the pace of this was extraordinary in mid-March. Uh, ironically, I think it was Friday the 13th of March, uh, I held my last regular hearings in my courtroom, not realizing in the moment that they were the last regular hearings I'd be holding in my courtroom for some time you know, a mix of mostly chapter 11 matters actually. And then uh, sort of over the weekend and by Monday, things here in New York City were changing fast and the directions were changing fast. And we're thinking, well, it looks like we may all be working remotely and I guess we'll do telephonic hearings and how's that gonna work? And fortunately we have the infrastructure and the kind of remote contingency that we thought we might need to be ready for on Friday afternoon or Monday morning of that weekend in mid-March you know, by, by midday Tuesday was, was old news. We were clearly going to remote. 
all of my colleagues and I are now working remotely. All of our court staff is working remotely and all of our hearings are telephonic. We adopted procedures uh, that we, I will say, um, in a judicial way, we scrambled a bit to get in place, to get the word out. Uh, we benefit from electronic filing, so we can tell everybody something immediately. And that, that's been huge to our uh, ability to migrate our work uh, from a courtroom physical uh, setting to a remote telephonic setting. Um, so everything changed, but also I think nothing changed as we were getting all that done. There were two days that week, I think, where I adjourned all of my hearings by a single administrative order into a date about four weeks out, just to give us a chance to get things literally in place, to conduct telephonic hearings, to get our orders out, to hear the matters, to, to hear the urgent matters. As you know, for example, the beginning of a big chapter 11 case, there can be a lot of things that need to be heard within the first 24 hours. Uh, so after that though, um, it was as much as we could muster business as usual, and here's why. Um, courthouses, aren't technically closed, but are pretty much closed in terms of court hearings and operation, but courts can't close. Insolvency courts can't close. Business courts can't close. U.S. bankruptcy courts don't close. Um, we're open for business. We're still hearing matters. Cases are still being filed. And in, you know, three to four, sometimes five days a week, uh, dozens of hearings at a stretch. I and my colleagues are still conducting our hearings telephonically um, and uh, getting the work of our court done. Uh, this happened with extraordinary speed. Um, as I said, from, from maybe Friday the 13th of March to Friday the 20th of March, the world changed. It's now been 11 weeks that we've been in this mode. Um, and, you know, I guess in a way so far so good. I miss the courtroom. I miss the opportunity to uh, interact directly with the bar and the clients um, and to see that physically in my courtroom. I miss the problem solving that happens in and near a courtroom and as a result of all that, but I have the greatest admiration for the bar and how they have really stepped up in these extraordinary times to keep the cases moving forward. There's, there's never enough time or enough money to kind of put your feet up in a business reorganization case, um, you know, to think about it for a few weeks and see if you get a better idea. Um, and that's, that's never been more true than now. Um, but how is it received? I think like everybody else, we, we scrambled, we, um, we adapted as quickly as we could, understanding that on the one hand, everything has changed, but on the other, there are some fundamental things that simply can't change and access to the courts and the process is, uh, is probably top of that list. So um, that's, that's, that's how it looked from our perspective. And we're still, I have hearings on the phone this afternoon and I had about eight hours of hearings today. So it's, you know, thank you, it goes on. Thank you. A, a, a follow-up question with that, if you allow me. Um, I know that it was so unexpected for everybody, but those the US courts were prepared or are prepared to handle this situation? Are U.S. courts prepared to handle the situation? I think the answer is absolutely yes. There has been a lot of planning over the years and even um, uh, 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 practice for what we call COOP, uh, continu uh, continuation of operations here in New York City. Some of our education in that happened quite suddenly on September 11, 2001, uh, when our Southern District Courthouse was you know, within feet or yards of ground zero. Um, so I think we were prepared. I think no one has been quite prepared for how, how long this has gone on for the, for the sense that we don't really know how much longer it's going to go on or what exactly it's going to be. But I think the work of the court is getting done and it's a, uh, it's a credit to the court infrastructure and our preparation and to the bar and hopefully at least the judges aren't messing it up too much. But I think we were prepared. <laughs> as much as anybody was prepared. Yvonne, were you prepared for this? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Great, thanks. Eric, so what's going on with the microeconomy? What's happening with the companies? How they are struggling with this? Can you tell us something about that, Eric, please? Sure, absolutely. Good morning, everyone. And I, I just noticed that my, my next-gen banner background, for some reason, is, uh, is backwards. So I guess I'm, I'm daring to be different this morning. But I appreciate everyone being with us. Sure, why don't, we, why don't we actually roll back the clock 90 days and take us back to February of the year where the health crisis in the U.S. was really just becoming a real thing and not just a curiosity that was happening in other countries. 
And as you move from February into early mid-March, companies were in the midst of the pandemic and the ever-growing buzz around it. Companies reached their real first decision crossroads, which was whether or not in the face of a health and safety crisis, they should voluntarily shut down. Now, not many did. A lot of them just tried to soldier through, not quite clear what the pandemic in the U.S. was actually going to evolve into, but many did take at least the short-term remediation action of increasing their health and safety precautions for their, their employees. The, uh, the second crossroads came very shortly thereafter, and that was a crossroads that was forced upon the businesses, and that was the designation of essential versus non-essential businesses in the United States. And that designation allowed businesses to either remain open or force them to close, depending on which side of the determination you landed, essential versus non-essential. And that determination varied state to state, which was it, it had generated an interesting result in the U.S. where an essential business in New York that could remain open may not have been essential in California and therefore had to close. So there were very much winners and losers in this essential versus non-essential determination and very different realities played out for the two different groups. Uh, the winners got to stay open, obviously, and keep people employed. Um, they had people stay home and work from home if feasible, but in many cases, employees can't work remotely. Think about manufacturing facilities with assembly lines. It's just not tenable to phone it in. And uh, companies with people working on site had to spend significant amount of money to, to really fully embrace the health and safety protocols that were being mandated by the, the bureaucracies, but also being, and rightly so, requested by the workforces who were being asked to come in and work. Uh, it wasn't all smooth sailing, clearly, for the winners in the essential designation, but they didn't need to really fully power down their engines. The losers were the ones deemed non-essential. They had to close their doors, send their people home, and worst of all, it was for an indefinite period of time, not knowing when you might be able to reopen. Retailers and restaurants get a lot of press in this space, but really the non-essential issue impacted a multitude of different industries, not just those that um, they get the marquee uh, billing in the press. Uh, customers were left without goods and services. Employees obviously were left without wages and having to rely on unemployment. Companies had to service their debts and many didn't really have the working capital to do so. So it left a lot of companies twisting in the wind. And as we speak, many of the non-essential businesses still remain closed as we sit here and talk today. Yeah, great, thanks, Eric. A follow-up question to that. I've been hearing that uh, there are a lot of industries, especially automotive industry, that are pushing up a lot to the government to allow them to restart operation. How do you see this as a scenario? Well, everybody's eager to get on with it, right? Um, and, and as you see certain states relaxing uh, re re um, restrictions on businesses opening, yeah. uh, and also in the face of growing consumer pressure, for getting goods and services that people traditionally had enjoyed and have been denied access to now for a period of time. Everybody is eager to, to move on. And some states have been more progressive than others in opening the doors and letting businesses deemed non-essential get back to what they do, partly to, uh, partly to address the concerns of the voters, partly to breathe new life and try to repower the local economies. Uh, but all coming, I think, from a good place of wanting to try to achieve some degree of normalcy, none of us really knowing what that looks like. But I think, I think it's all coming from a good place. Uh, it's not necessarily being channeled in, 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 a, in a, the most positive way in a lot of cases with uh, uh, suits playing out and legislatures being juxtaposed with decisions by local governors. It, it's becoming ugly in some cases. And so I think some federal guidance, uh, more so perhaps than we've seen, and consistent federal guidance would be useful in helping companies navigate through all that but it's yet to come and the states really have been left on a state-by-state -state basis to find their own way through this tricky landscape. Thank you, man. Uh, Evan, uh, now uh, what's going on with the practical uh, matter? Uh, the practice of the insolvency law has changed. Do we have to adapt ourselves for a new scenario? Sure, thank you, Ivan. Yes, uh, COVID-19 has brought numerous changes to the practice of law. Some of them were statutory uh, through the CARES Act, others were through court orders on the way we operate and the way we practice. And some of the changes were just creative lawyering by practitioners. And some of these changes may say some of them are going to be more long-term lasting effects for practitioners on how we operate. 
And some of this is actually going to test recent reforms that we had. So in the United States, just before COVID started, we recently implemented uh, a small business subchapter five. It's a more streamlined version of our chapter 11 process. And the effects of COVID will really test the effectiveness of this small, small business plan. Uh, recently, as part of the United States response to COVID-19, we increased the debt limitation allowed for debtors to access subchapter five. So it was raised from 2.7 million to 7.5 million. Interestingly, the 7.5 million number was the number that the National Bankruptcy Conference believed would be the right number to allow small businesses into subchapter five. And so we, I think we will see during this response an increased number of subchapter five bankruptcy cases and really see whether this is an effective tool for a more streamlined version of Chapter 11. Okay, so what can we expect from um, the legislative uh, perspective to go into this situation to attend the reality of our days? I, I think the legislation is adopting. They are taking some steps to address the situation going on, but some of the changes right now are really coming through judge-made law, through creative lawyering, uh, and trying to figure out the appropriate response and really how to handle something that our bankruptcy code didn't fully co contemplate, but that there are provisions of the code that could be useful to sort of create new law um, where possible to address these current situations. Thank you, Evan. So, Steve, Going back into the current perspective, uh, we have heard from all of us uh, what is the, how we, uh, the COVID was uh, attended. But what's going on right now? Uh, what is the U.S. economy playing in this uh, world, world uh, scenario? The U.S. economy, in a word, is in fairly serious, uh, in a fairly serious condition. The GDP, uh, the economic growth, uh, has dropped uh, sharply. Um, uh, in the second quarter, which is not yet complete, it's projected that uh, GDP uh, will drop at an annual rate. This is if it were annualized, uh, 40%, which is just huge. Uh, that's from the Congressional Budget Office. Um, and it would drop 12%, but on an annual basis, uh, 40% uh, by the end of the year. Um, now, the projections for the end of the year are more modest because uh, there's an expected... Uh, pick up in economic activity in the second half of the year. Uh, so the Congressional Budget Office, CBO, is projecting uh, GDP will be minus 5.6% uh, for the entire year. Uh, one figure that is truly uh, astonishing is the unemployment rate. Um, Unemployment uh, at the end of April was 14.7%. And um, unemployment is projected to continue to increase uh, for the remainder of the year. Uh, the administration's chief economist uh, was on television the other day, and he said um, the unemployment rate uh, could go up to 20 to 25 percent by the end of the year. So those are levels we haven't seen since the Great Depression. Uh, so that's truly concerning, of course. Um, and uh, one other important indicator, in my view, is the uh, level of consumer confidence. I was looking at an index of that the other day, and that has dropped precipitously. And that's important because um, in the U.S. economy, uh, consumer demand uh, has traditionally driven the economy. And so if there's no consumer confidence, uh, that's a very serious issue. Um, in terms of the world economy, um, 
again, with the lockdown, uh, lockdowns across the world, uh, economic activity has, of course, dropped across the board. But uh, those pro projections continue to change on a monthly basis. Uh, the IMF put out uh, projections in uh, March that were fairly negative as to the global economic outlook. And then just a few weeks ago, the IMF managing director, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, the new managing director, she was speaking at a Financial Times conference. She said the projections the IMF made from just a month earlier uh, were already out of date and the situation could be much worse. So I think it's um, uh, very useful that you mentioned the global perspective as well, because the U.S. obviously is not an island unto itself and operates in the global economy. And in fact, in the 0809 crisis, the emerging markets uh, helped fuel the growth that pulled the world out of that uh, deep economic recession. But the emerging markets this time are very seriously impacted and uh, that situation will continue to develop in the emerging markets. Thank you, Steve. Your Honor, uh, what's going on in the U.S. courts? Do, does you have more uh, work? Unmute, yes, uh, the answer is yes. Um, we, have, we, we do have more work. We had plenty of work going into this and we're already seeing in some larger cases, especially, I think, uh, an increase in the work coming up. I think this comes from at least two sources. One is companies and uh, individuals that were facing some kind of financial stress, maybe coming into this and, of course, become dramatically worse. The cases that were challenging have now become, you know, doubly so. Um, and, of course, so many companies have been affected uh, from the largest companies, particularly in the industries that are the obvious line uh, victims of this kind of a slowdown uh, uh, to, you know, the whole, the ripple effect, the companies affected by those companies and by those companies and by those companies. And just every, every small business that you see in your neighborhood and those, those small businesses, as, as Evan pointed out, may have a new tool now with our new uh, U.S. subchapter uh, five. But yeah, we're, we were busy before and we're, we're busier now. And I think we're going to be more busier, forget the phrase, uh, in, in, the, in the near future and then the midterm future. It's, it's a lot of work to get a case on file. I hear that from my friends in practice. And there are probably cases that could be filed now if everyone could get their jobs done in the ordinary way, right? And, and they can't quite yet. So, so I think, yeah, we're, we're busy and we're, and we're getting, we're anticipating getting busier. Uh, I, both because things are a little harder to get done these days and just because there's so to do. I, I can't remember a time when I've, when I've worked harder and my chief has worked harder to get the, the work of the court done. And that has to do with the, the caseload we had coming into this uh, and the caseload that has been developed since then. And of course, the caseload we know is coming. Thank you, Your Honor. Eric, what's going on with the breaching of contracts, the unpayment? What's the current situation for the companies? Well, uh, you remember the two parallel tracks I talked about earlier when I spoke, which were the winners and losers under the essential versus non-essential determination. In answer to your question, two very different realities are playing out for those camps. So the essential businesses struggling through the pandemic, they've, they've been beset by supply chain issues, workforce issues, et cetera, but they've been able to stay in business and, and keep the, the train on the tracks to a great degree. Key issues there have included, how do you convince your employees that the workplace is safe for them and that they're not gonna contract the virus by simply coming in and fulfilling their day-to-day -day responsibilities? Businesses are also wondering to what degree is customer demand gonna snap back to historic levels or has their business model fundamentally changed forever? Um, I'm working with a lot of clients where one of the key features of any engagement I'm working on right now is running financial sensitivity analyses around 
what does your business look like if it only comes back to a 50% revenue run rate or a 75% revenue run rate? And what if it comes back to 100%, but it takes three years to get there? And what is your plan for all of that? But those are all high class problems to have because you're a business that has been deemed essential and, and been able to operate throughout the entirety of the pandemic. Not essential businesses are facing a much more fundamental issue, right? So to your issue on breaches of contracts and that sort of thing, one, they're trying to determine when they're going to be allowed to reopen on any basis, and that's not clear, uh, especially in, in, in states that have been slow to come back online, like my home state of Massachusetts. Uh, and then also the, the other fundamental core issue is whether or not I'm allow, allowed to reopen, should I, right? Not just a question of whether you can reopen, but rather, should you do it on any basis? And that's a pretty fundamental issue for people to, to wrestle with. It's, um, you've seen, you've heard Steve talk about the government stimulus programs that were intended to try to prop up these businesses as they sorted through those kinds of issues. Uh, but in most cases, it was very limited relief geared towards payroll in, in most cases, and for a very limited duration of time, only about eight weeks. So there was some help, but it didn't buy companies a lot of time to wade through these issues of should I even bother reopening? And if you're not going to reopen, then the calculus changes rather dramatically as to what you do about breaching contracts and addressing unpaid liabilities and that sort of thing. One, one, one aspect of behavior that both the winners and the losers adopted was to go into a mode of extreme cash conservation. I know I was preaching that doctrine. I know all of my, my peers and colleagues in the industry were preaching that doctrine of trying to accelerate cash collections, delay cash disbursements, and really conserve a war chest of funds that would help you ride out the storm for however long it lasted. Thank you, Eric. Evan? Certainly, things have been changing all the scenario. Uh, how do you think this has changed the playbook of the insolvency game? Sorry, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, trouble on muting. Uh, so the, the, the traditional playbook, uh, many of the laws that we have traditionally thought about have changed. One of the examples is when a debtor files for bankruptcy, they have to pay their landlords on a post-petition basis current, except for the first 60 days in which they can get an extension for a cause. Uh, that statute doesn't provide for an extension beyond 60 days, but through creative lawyering and the current pandemic, that we, we now see that it is possible to potentially extend the debtor's ability to, to pay rent on a current basis while there is a lockdown. This has sort of forced people to rethink necessarily how a bankruptcy case is going to work. If a debtor can, in a unique circumstance, extend the time in which they have to pay their post-petition rent obligation, are they able to use that cash for some other purpose and temporarily restructure and amass capital to pay all of creditors? One of the other things that we've seen in this case is that uh, in these cases are the Paycheck Protection Program that the government put out to help individual companies struggling pay their employees is that the Small Business Association actually included in their form a question that said, if you are affiliated with, or if you are involved in a bankruptcy, please check this box. And the Small Business Administration has been turning down part loan participants' access to money if they check that box. First, we know that that box is unclear, involved in a bankruptcy. Does that mean a creditor, a debtor, are you an equity interest holder? The question was just vague. Um, so that was one problem that we've seen so far with it. And the other pro so we have that issue and the government is afraid to, they don't want to put the money into a company, but the statute, the CARES Act doesn't actually limit the SBA's ability to determine whether the bank, a debtor's bankruptcy is a condition on which they should judge whether to provide a paycheck protection program. So what, we've, so what lawyers have done is they've filed temporary restraining orders seeking to prevent the SBA from denying their loan applications to try to preserve some of the money that's in the paycheck protection program to allow debtors access to this. We've also seen one of the creative arguments addressing this is that 
there is a provision of bankruptcy code that prevents the unfair discrimination by the government of a debtor in bankruptcy. Because this paycheck protection program is essentially a forgivable loan, what people have said is that it's an essentially a government grant. And specifically 525A of the bankruptcy code prevents the government from discriminating in who they give grants to on the basis of the fact that a debtor is in bankruptcy. The results of these cases have been mixed and it's not necessarily clear whether the SB, what the SBA's authority is in those cases are currently being litigated. But I think what it shows is that through creative lawyering right now, we are seeing debtors, lenders, landlords, all rethinking what some of the laws are and trying to see, is there a way that you can change the law and still recognize that the fact that there are, the bankruptcy law just doesn't contemplate pandemics. And so what can we do to say everybody could equally share in some of the pain, right? The idea behind the landlords, there's not paying the landlords is, it's not just everybody else that's having pain. So why should landlords be made whole when everybody else is sharing in the pain? The idea of our US bankruptcy code is that there should be some sort of equitable treatment for all. So I think judges are trying to struggle with that balance of how does everybody sort of equitably share in the pain and the benefits of the bankruptcy code. Thank you, man. So I do believe that this is a very unexpected scenario for the whole world and each country has been trying to handle it as its best convenience, but there is a lot of work to do. And the main question that I do believe that we have at this point is what is going on? What will we happen after all of this, after, after the lockdown? So Steve, what are the missing elements that the U.S. government has not uh, done yet? And what are the prospects for the U.S. economy? Those are two tough questions. Um, and I'll try to take a stab at them, uh, Ivan. Um, missing elements, um, as I've said earlier uh, in this webinar, uh, there will need to be a major stimulus program uh, passed by Congress. Most of what has been passed so far, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is basically uh, focused on relief uh, for workers and businesses. But it's not the classic type of stimulus spending programs uh, that attend uh, a recovery effort. Um, What's happened so far, um, what Congress uh, has authorized spending on doesn't have the, what we would call the classic fiscal multiplier effect. Uh, for example, if you're building a bridge or building a road, that has multiplier effects for the economy. And what's uh, transpired so far, while important, uh, doesn't necessarily uh, have that strong stimulative effect. So that's one major area. And of course, uh, as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, uh, although Congress acted in a very bipartisan way in the first three phases of their action, um, now we're into a more partisan phase. Uh, the House of Representatives passed um, a very large measure, the so-called HEROES Act, championed by Speaker Pelosi uh, for about $3 trillion. Um, but that uh, bill is considered dead on arrival in the hands of Senator Mitch McConnell, uh, the uh, majority leader in the Senate. So um, that's a non-starter for now. So uh, the Senate and the House will have to come together. But uh, even beyond that, uh, they'll have to be thinking about stimulus spending. Um, we've, heard, we've heard some talk earlier in the webinar by Evan and Eric about this Small Business Administration, uh, and that highlights the fact that there have been serious implementation issues that uh, the business, a lot of businesses that wanted to get loans couldn't get the loans because of the bureaucracy at the SBA. And so, uh, that will need to be addressed. Uh, the Federal Reserve is rolling out a new program, the Main Street Lending Program, to help businesses between 
the small businesses covered by the Paycheck Protection Program, and then the larger corporate uh, borrowing program, the two programs that the Federal Reserve has set up. Now, um, on the economic outlook, uh, I'll try to deal with this in a minute or two, but of course, uh, it's very unclear what the economic outlook is because uh, in large part, it comes back to the medicine and science and epidemiology. Will there be a vaccine? Will there be therapeutic treatments? Uh, and that will uh, heavily influence uh, the nature and speed of the economic recovery. Briefly stated, um, there are different uh, types of recovery. Um, up until the last month, some economists were talking about a quick bounce back. Uh, that was a so-called V-shaped recovery. Uh, and that would be the uh, best case scenario. But now, um, Many economists are very skeptical about that type of recovery. Uh, they think it may either be more of a U-shaped recovery, which is sort of what we had in 08, 09, uh, a slower, more gentle rebound. And then um, uh, there's a W-shaped recovery. That would be sort of a double dip recession. Uh, some economists think that might happen if we have a serious second wave of uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. And then uh, finally, the worst case scenario uh, would be um, an L-shaped recovery. And finally, um, there's something that some economists refer to as the Nike swoosh recovery, uh, like the Nike logo. Very long recovery, very slow recovery, and then even when the economy recovers, it doesn't come to the level um, where it had been previously. So uh, there's a lot of uh, speculation on this, uh, and as I say, the science and the medicine and epidemiology are critical, and even uh, Jerome Powell, the chair of the Fed, has said the recovery could take us through the end of 2021. That sounds, uh, how to say it, <laughs> very risky and frightening. So we will go on into that. Uh, Your Honor, what are the challenges for the upcoming insolvency cases? It's difficult to go that, as Steve already said, that it's difficult to foresee in the future, but what's about the in, uh, incoming cases? Unmute now. Um, I, you know, where to begin? Is it an L? I don't like an L-shaped recovery. That doesn't feel good. Um, I think the challenges are both very immediate. Uh, how do we hold evidentiary hearings if we need to? Um, and very, very long term. How do we make the cases work? How do we make the current cases work? How do we make the future cases work? Um, that's good for debtors, of course, and it's good for workers and communities, but it's also good for creditors because it means they're getting paid. Of course, you don't confirm a plan until everyone is better off than they'd be with whatever the alternative is. Or as I, as I sometimes say when I'm working with judges outside the US, the rising tide has to raise all the boats at least a little bit. Um, I think we need ways to be sure that there's enough runway in the cases to let the company get through the current moment and then um, continue on its restructuring path. You've probably seen references to things called mothball orders. Um, uh, just this morning, there was an update in one of the bankruptcy newsletters about uh, one of the big retailers getting uh, relief on paying its rent for the next couple of months. Um, I've seen a real trend toward voluntary forbearance. Um, and I've seen it in everything from Chapter 11 cases to uh, consumer cases in Chapter 13 where people are trying to save their homes. Um, there's no reason to proceed with foreclosure today. There's probably no reason for a big commercial landlord to throw out a tenant, which um, holds at least the prospect of some sort of business uh, uh, in the near or medium term. Who are they going to replace it with? And how are they better off? And I think the interplay of the legal issues, what does the law permit? And you heard about some of this from Evan. Uh, and um, the business issues, and you heard about these from Eric, uh, 
Uh, what, what really is the best business decision for a company at this point looks a whole lot different, I suspect, than it looked uh, three to six months ago when maybe this was something you know buried deep in the front section of the newspaper if you still get a paper paper um you know i do so i think those are some of the challenges um i, I think keeping keeping the process moving forward keeping um people having confidence people and investors money um business people whether it's a small entrepreneur or the corner restaurant or a or a, or a big multinational company being sure that our system is doing the best it can and all the different insolvency systems, but if ours is the one I, I work in, uh, to be sure that people have the confidence that this is a, uh, this really is a prospect for a better outcome than a, um, than a, than a not restructuring. And uh, so long as people see that happening and know that can happen and the costs are reasonable in proportion to the opportunities and courts are getting their work done, then I, you know, I think we'll be meeting and overcoming the challenges, but it's, uh, you know, trying to make the case work. I, one of the questions in the Q and A is: Has there been a formal or statutory suspension of terms? I think even if there hasn't been in a statutory way, what I see in here in my courtroom—that's a term of art now—is that there really does, at least for now, I hope this doesn't change. Seem to be a willingness to keep the process working, uh, to let the process work, to get through the worst of these current months, and and see what kind of going concern value we can we can um, preserve it at, you know, in the next phase of Steve's B or W or L or U, whatever it turns out to be. So those are, those are some of the challenges. I think getting, getting court staff back in the courthouse is a challenge. And I hope that happens as soon as it can. I think getting everybody back into the courtroom so we can have the kind of very productive interaction that happens in a courtroom, that's gonna take longer. Thanks. Thank you, Your Honor. Eric, the same difficult question for you. How companies can handle this crisis? Well, again, I think there's a dichotomy between those essential businesses which have had the benefit of staying in business throughout the pandemic versus the non-essential businesses that have had to close down. And the essential businesses are frankly feeling the, the, the same corporate emotions and corporate challenges that we on a personal level are, are feeling to a certain extent, relief about having survived the pandemic, but serious anxiety about the unknowns that we're all, that we're all staring at. And uh, there are challenges for essential businesses along the line of significant portion of the workforce may now permanently remain working from home, which could be, frankly, a significant savings benefit for corporations as they reduce their physical footprints in various places. But that's, that's a trend that's been taking place over the course of time, but clearly this poured gasoline on that fire has accelerated uh, the, the way in which companies can work from home and that workers can, can get things done. The, um, there's also the, the wrestling with the issue of unknown customer demand that may be reduced for an uncertain period of time. So companies are looking at that and, and I and my colleagues are preaching a doctrine of engaging in cost cutting exercises to stay as lean as possible. It's the old adage in the restructuring world, never fail to take advantage of a good crisis. And so that's what we are espousing to our, to our clients that they, 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 they prepare for the worst and hope for the best. The losers that have been shut down for some or all of the pandemic today, again, are facing a much more fundamental question, you know, to be or not to be really. And if the answer is no, that there really isn't a place for you in the new world order uh, or that your relevance to the marketplace is, has gone away, then you're facing either an out-of-court wind down or an in-court proceeding uh, aimed at the same result in terms of winding down, including the business affairs of the company. If the answer is yes, then you should restart and, you, and you've done that math and, and you can in good conscience say that it does make sense to give it a run, then are your employees still available to you to come back to work? Or frankly, have they moved on with their lives throughout all this? Is there even a workforce there for you if you choose to restart? What kind of capital support are you going to need in order to efficiently and effectively restart. Um, there's a working capital need to prime the pump in order to get the flywheel spun up for a business. Uh, banks by and large have been pretty good about helping companies get through COVID-19, but there's gonna be a day of reckoning at some point where 
companies need to start performing again, or there are going to be some real hard conversations with their lenders. For those companies that were chronic offenders and were already struggling before COVID-19 hit, I think the banks are going to take a lot more aggressive line with them, and there's going to be rationalization there. Last but not least, companies are struggling. What does the new business model look like? And frankly, sports teams in this country are a great example. Now that they're finally coming back online, it's, it's a welcome sight to see games being played, at least in an exhibition sense, and see players going back to practice. But frankly, it's surreal to see teams playing games in empty stadiums. And that's got clear implications for that business model where all of the foot traffic by the attendees of those live events was driving significant revenue streams that in no small part allowed those players to be paid the exorbitant salaries in some cases that they're paid. So that model's out the window and, and the, the sports teams are going to have to fundamentally retrofit how they approach the go forward and profit sharing issues and everything else that's attendant to that. So they're going to have to remake themselves. Steve Thank touched you. on stimulus programs. Uh, that could be the difference between life and death for a lot of companies, frankly, is the, the nature and the targets of future stimulus programs that the U.S. government rolls out. But uh, it is true that uh, just because you were a fundamentally healthy company before COVID-19 and you found some way to navigate your way through that minefield, that certainly doesn't ensure go forward success. I think every company needs to take on the challenge of looking at themselves hard in the mirror. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, man. Uh, Evan, so how do you see the precedents for all of this? Um, do you think that the law might change for the future and the, all the practice in the policy? Yeah, I, I think that some laws are here to stay and some will only be temporarily. For example, we talked earlier about whether under 365A you could stay a debtor in, a debtor's obligation to pay a landlord beyond 60 days after the bankruptcy case. You know, courts have said they've never, this is the clear case of cause and why it should be allowed to be extended because of the fact that there's this pandemic that nobody first saw. But you could see, you could see lawyers thinking, what other context could this happen if there's a hurricane and all stores are closed because of the hurricane? Can you have a similar relief if businesses aren't open? The statute doesn't contemplate these things, and I, so I think some of the precedents that are established now, we will see ripple effects for years to come in other situations in which we're going to lawyers will, and judges will try to make a comparison. If stores are closed, if businesses are closed, should there be some set of extraordinary relief that's not specifically provided for in the bankruptcy code to allow for these situations and handle these situations within court? Great, Devon. Uh, thank you. This has been very interesting. Uh, we can keep going all the day, but uh, certainly you have a lot of things to do. And um, we are going to go into a closing argument with our president, Deborah Grassgreen. And after that, we will go into the Q&A. We have some Q&As. And if you want to do an additional closure argument, you will be allowed. Deborah, thank you for your time. Well, good morning, afternoon, if others are in other places of the world, but here it's still quite early in the morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you to the panelists and to, you know, our Next Gen team for putting this together and the series of webinars. As, um, as you all know, you've heard me say it and everybody else say it a hundred times. These are unprecedented times, and I'm really proud of the work that the I and the Next Gen in particular has done to really rise to the occasion jump in and address the issues. One of the senior members of III has been quoted in the press in the UK, Mark Phillips, is saying that the healthcare workers are, um, they're saving lives, but our industry is gonna be saving livelihoods. And it really couldn't be more true with everything that's going on. So um, I think it's really important that as busy as everybody is, we're getting together, we're talking about these issues, we're sharing um, work and solutions of how to address them. So I really want to commend everybody for putting this together. Um, a couple of things, Triple I and NextGen quickly pivoted as quickly as we could 
from our, our normal process of having really productive in-person meetings and the opportunity for people to collaborate together to our new online format. And it's not ideal, but I think it's working pretty well under the circumstances. But I wanna encourage everybody, particularly the next gens who tend to think out of the box, if you have ideas and suggestions of different things that we could be doing to be contributing in a meaningful way to please call me, call Annika, reach out to anyone, Ivan, and, um, and let's just make sure that the organizations generally, NextGen and IIII together, are doing everything we can to be relevant in this really unusual time. So thank you for your time, great presentation, and I look forward to the next one. Thank you, Debra. So right now we are closing the recording session that will be available in the IIII's uh, website, and uh, we will go out of record going into the Q&A uh, questions. Um, I'm so